All right, now I want to briefly introduce our talented superstars of today. Uh, first is Laura Turner Igo, our curator of American art here at the James A. Vintner Art Museum. Laura, are you there? Can you say hello? Hello, everyone. So nice to see you all. Hello, Laura. <laughs> After Laura, we'll hear from Tara Kaufman, our curatorial assistant. Tara, are you there? Hi, everyone. Thanks for being here. <laughs> And last, we'll hear from Adrian Romano, my colleague in our education department and our leader of interpreter projects. Adrian, are you there? Hi, everybody. Nice to see you all. <laughs> Fantastic. All right, that's enough for me. I'm gonna turn it over to Laura. Great, thanks, Matt. So thank you all again for being here. I'm, I'm, we're all really excited to talk about Coppage today. Um, and so I, I wanted to start by introducing uh, the exhibition that the scrapbooks are a part of. Um, so this exhibition is called Friend Coppage New, oh, I have the wrong title, I apologize. It's New Discoveries <laughs> and it's up until April 18th. Um, and you'll see that it does focus on new acquisitions which is why this older title unfortunately snuck in. Uh, so this exhibition highlights some or shares some new insight about Coppage and her work following our recent acquisition of four paintings by the artist and the digitization of the Fern Coppage scrapbooks from the museum's library and archives. So who is Fern Coppage? I know many of you are, are familiar with her and her work, um, but she was born on her family's farm in 1883 near Decatur, Illinois. And she studied at prestigious art academies across the country, including the Art Institute of Chicago, the Art Student League in New York, and the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts in Philadelphia. So in 1920, Coppage and her husband Robert bought a house and studio in Lumberville, Pennsylvania, close to Cutaloso, where Daniel Garber lived. And she studied, Coppage studied with Garber at PAFA. She was nationally celebrated for her landscape paintings and she challenged pictorial conventions with her bold, colorful compositions. And here are two of um, the museum's recent uh, acquisitions of Coppage paintings. So although she initially painted in an impressionistic manner comparable to that of Garber and other painters that were based in and around New Hope, Pennsylvania, she developed her own distinctive style following a trip to Italy in the mid 1920s. And Adrienne's gonna talk a little bit more about that trip too when, um, during her part of the presentation. So after her return from Italy, her compositions became more abstracted and two-dimensional. I, th I think this um, painting on the left uh, kind of nicely illustrates that as she applied these broad strokes of paint to delineate the region's architecture and national, natural features. And I love, I love, I just really love the, this painting on the left winter landscape and especially that kind of bright red or almost pinkish red barn that really draws you into the landscape. And she was recognized at, at, you know, during her time for her use of colors. Critics applauded these glowing colors for their emotional expression. And here are two more paintings. Um, so these are again, new, two new acquisitions to our collection that we're just thrilled to share with our visitors. And another big component of this exhibition um, was the digitization of the Fern Coppage scrapbooks. Um, so we have three scrapbooks in our uh, library and archives collection, and these are filled with newspaper clippings, pamphlets, and other printed material covering Coppage's career from 1916 until her death in 1951. Uh, they can contain important information about her exhibition history, her evolving style, and critical reception. And they were likely compiled by the artist herself, um, although there are additional newspaper clippings um, about her, you know, obituaries and things that were probably, obviously, <laughs> probably, that were added after her death. <laughs> and two of these scrapbooks were donated to the Michener by the descendants of architect and artist Henry McNeil and his wife, Chester County historian, Amy Junker, Amy Junker McNeil, who were friends of Coppage and who also inherited many examples of her artwork. Um, and they were first donated to the Bucks County Council of the Arts in 1979, and then later in the 1990s transferred to our collection. And I think you can see a little bit in this image from the exhibition that these are very fragile, um, fragile books. Um, the newspaper newspaper clippings do not last very long, um, and they're they're 
we wanted to we wanted to protect them for future generations. And so we partnered with the Conservation Center for Art and Historic Artifacts in Philadelphia to scan and digitize them in order to make them more accessible to researchers and any interested parties. And Matt, if you don't mind um, putting the links to the scrapbooks in the chat um, to share, that would be great. So you can find links to these scrapbooks on the exhibitions webpage. If you go under to the Mishra's website under exhibitions and burn coppage, you'll see them there. And you can also find them on Google Arts and Culture, our Google Arts and Culture page. Um, so you can browse the scrapbooks to your heart's content from your living room at home. Um, no trip to the archives necessary. So we're, we're just so happy to have this available um, for others to see. And so today, you know, we're sharing discoveries that we each have made from the scrapbooks, from spending time with these significant documents. And when Jersey Village um, came to our collection and we began researching it, um, it became immediately clear that this, this painting was widely produced in the scrapbooks. Um, and you'll see here on the right, a clipping from the Philadelphia record. Um, and it says across the top, winning entries in art contest. And um, the blur below talks about how it won second prize or in other instances, it's called gold medal in the painting class in women's in a, the women's achievement competition. And you'll see here's just a few more examples. It appears quite frequently in the scrapbook, this, this, um, this painting. So here and here's Jersey Village here, just a bigger image of it here. Um, and this is really what's so wonderful about the scrapbooks as a resource is so many of her paintings are reproduced um, in these newspaper clippings. And so you can trace the exhibition history of um, paintings in our collection. And, and if any coppage collectors are out there, you too can look through the scrapbook and see if your painting is, is reproduced. And also here as well, this here's Jersey Village here and then also here. So as I was, you know, seeing this painting pop up and the frequent mention of it winning a medal in the women's achievement competition, I naturally wondered, what is what was the women's achievement competition? I hadn't seen that before and in, in, in past research I had done, I, I did see that in the um, Coppage exhibition catalog from our um, from the exhibition the Michener did in the 1990s that the women's achievement competition is mentioned, but I, I was just curious, like, what, it, what was that? And so I did some deep dives uh, into this competition, um, looking, you know, through newspapers, you know, online and things like that, that uh, the women's achievement competition uh, was hosted by the Gimbel's department store in 1932 to celebrate its 90th anniversary. So Gimbel's opened in Philadelphia in 1894 at 8th and Market Street, and it joined um, such illustrious stores as Wanamaker's, Litz, and Strawbridge's as these shopping, these shopping palaces downtown. Um, Gimbel's featured these glittering window displays and chandeliers, fresh flowers, mahogany counters. It was one of the first department stores to have an escalator. Um, and it, it, it introduced this competition um, and dedicated it to the women of America who are responsible for the growth of the gimbal business from the Little Crossroads Country Store in 1842 to one of the largest mercantile businesses of the world today. Um, and of course, 1932, this is also, you know, really during the height of the Great Depression. So Gimbel's is also trying to um, bring in shoppers. <laughs> it's, it's trying to bring people in and also project a sense of optimism, enticing enticing um, shoppers. So in this ad here, it's hard to see, but along the bottom, um, it's, it declares factories are reopening, prices have stopped falling, things are looking up. Um, so this, this, great, this great sense of optimism. And so this women's achievement competition included awards in painting and sculpture, but then also cake making, candy making, knitted dresses, jellies, photographs, dress designs, and lampshades, which were combined for some reason, and quilts. So it, it, was, a, it was ran the gamut of both fine art um, and then what were also was also considered um, the domestic arts too at the time. Oh, and so and the painting competition was judged actually by some artists that are in our collection as well. So Joseph Pearson was the chair of the um, of the painting committee, um, and Fred Fred Wagner, um, who you see his canal at Lumberville on the right, was also on the committee. And perhaps not surprising, all the judges for the painting, sculpture, and photographs competition were all men, uh, but all other competitions were judged by women judges. 
And so it was, a, it was a success for Gimbals in a lot of ways. So 600 people attended the award ceremony and the grand prize competition, which uh, selected from all groups, I thought this was interesting. The, so the, the, winner, the grand prize winners um, really highlighted themes of motherhood and domesticity. And unfortunately, I don't have images of these, these winners. I, I read about them in newspaper articles. Um, but the first, place, uh, the first place in the grand prize competition went to a Sydney Wright from Glenside for her blonde baby painting. Um, and uh, so a mother and child group is how it was described. Uh, second place went to a Mrs. Charles Francis Griffith for a bas relief sculpture of a child's head and a blue and white quilt by Mabel Daniels won third, third prize. So they really again highlighted these, um, these images of, of motherhood and domesticity. And the winner of the painting competition, even though many of the articles in the scrapbook proclaim that Fern Coppage won a prize for Jersey Village or a gold medal. Um, the winner was actually the first prize went to Nancy Ferguson, who was um, who also was in the group, the Philadelphia Ten with Coppage. So the Philadelphia Ten were a group of women painters who exhibited together in the early 20th century in order to generate more exhibition opportunities for themselves um, in, a, in an art world that was really dominated by male artists. Um, so Nancy Ferguson won first prize for her church by the sea, and I couldn't find that specific painting, but I, it was described as an elevated view of Provincetown, Massachusetts, where Ferguson frequently um, spent, spent most of her summers. And here's some examples of um, Provincetown views by her, one at the Woodmere on the left and another um, that sold at auction um, about a decade ago that show, um, show churches as well, the church towers. And the Inquirer wrote, um, had, it, had it interesting, <laughs> called the Philadelphia, when they, when they were describing the winners of the painting competition, the Inquirer said, quote, that unusual Philadelphia organization of women, the 10 Philadelphia painters has reason to be proud of its members, end quote, because of Coppage's and um, Ferguson's awards. So, I mean, that was what, that, to come back to Coppage's Jersey Village, um, it was just wonderful to be able to find some of that exhibition history and also it gained, I gained greater insight into, um, you know, what, where women artists were exhibiting at the time, you know, they were ex exhibiting in, you know, at the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts and at other well-known art institutions, but um, they also were exhibiting at these um, kind of, you know, department store exhibitions celebrating of quote unquote women's achievements. So they were, there was, they were being creative and where they were sending their work and Coppish was creative and when she was sending her work and it clearly paid off for her because of, she seemed to have gotten some great press out of that um, appearance as well. And so to conclude my part of the presentation today, um, there, is, there is a lingering question that I have with this work and I've discussed this with many people standing in front of this painting in the gallery as well, but what Jersey Village do you think we're looking at? And if you wanna put it some responses in the chat, I'd be curious to see them. So I'm relatively, I grew up in Philadelphia but I don't know as Bucks County um, that well quite yet. Um, of course, you can see here, we have a steel truss bridge that's off to the side. Um, I, I, I think it could, I've, I've had some, you know, I, I feel like it could possibly be Stockton, New Jersey, looking towards um, Center Bridge. Perhaps this is the Center Bridge Inn. But anyway, I'd love to hear your thoughts. You, you can put in the chat if you want to email me later on. Um, that would be wonderful. I know, I know we, I'm sure we have some um, knowledgeable Bucks County residents, um, River Towns residents in the group. So thank you. And I will pass it on over to Tara. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, let me just share my screen quickly. Okay. Uh, thanks, Laura. That was interesting. I hadn't heard all that story before. Um, so, um, so I'm talking about um, Fern Coppage um, kind of through her critical reception, um, but specifically the reception of her snow scenes. Um, um, so I have a few quotes that I wanna share with you and then we'll, I'm gonna look at them in kind of a broader context. Um, but there's a lot of quotes that describe Fern, Fern Coppage in sort of these outrageous, amazing ways. Like there's a really great stories about her that are published over and over again. Um, um, and they're fun to read, but they're also very interesting um, for how we can get an idea of the challenges that um, Fern Coppage and other women artists faced um, during their time. Um, so 
uh, from Coppage, she did grow up in the Midwest. Um, as someone who's also from the Midwest, I can say that we did get a lot of snow. Um, <laughs> so she was interested in painting snow very early. Um, she has this um, kind of well-known quote from her where she says, people used to think me queer when I was a little girl because I saw deep purples and reds and violets in a field of snow. Um, but she made a career out of her colorful paintings um, and her snow scenes were particularly celebrated. Um, you can see in this detail um, of the road to Lumberville that there are some purples and greens in the snow. Um, this painting is reproduced in the scrapbooks quite a bit too um, and is also in our collection. Um, so I have three quotes that I wanna share with you um, and then I'll talk about them in more detail. So I'm just gonna read them to you real quick. Um, so this first one is from the Philadelphia Record um, and it, there's not a specific date for this one, uh, but the other articles on the scrapbook page are around 1929, so maybe in, around that year. Um, but this one reads, uh, the worst thing that the weatherman can hand Miss Coppage is a snowless winter. Two years ago, she braved the fury of a blizzard to make a picture. Crouched in two feet of snow and with a storm raging about her and with fingers stiff from the icy blasts, she painted one of the best snow pictures of her career. Her canvas was lashed to a tree and at times it banged and fluttered like a sail. Miss Coppage goes forth to paint the glories of winter while most folks are hugging their fires and longing for spring. So right away there's this idea that she doesn't need to stay in her studio like tucked away from the weather. She's defying nature. She's like, going outside and she's like, I'm gonna make my work. I don't care about this blizzard. Um, and you'll see this kind of repeated throughout these quotes. Um, so this next one, personally, I think this is my favorite. Um, so this was published um, in this exhibition pamphlet for a show she had at the Independent Gallery New Hope, which was kind of the more modernist gallery. Um, but so this writer, Virginia Arnold, said that Fern Coppage is no pink tea painter. Born a man, she undoubtedly would have manned a trawler and sailed the Arctic Ocean. So again, it's like man versus nature. <laughs> Um, and then the last one I want to share is from um, the New York Evening Post from 1931. Um, and this one reads, um, Fern Coppage isn't at all what anyone could call a parlor painter of snow scenes. She doesn't sit warm and cozy by the window in a comfortable room and paint what she sees through the glass, not for a minute. A really worthwhile snowstorm brings her out in, a, in her bearskin coat, cap with earmuffs and fur gloves to go tramping through the deep drifts till she finds the perfect spot to set up her easel. Then she paints until her fingers are stiff in their thick gloves and must be thought out before she can go on. Um, so these are just three quotes that I've selected um, from the scrapbooks, but they represent like this very common way that critics describe Fern Coppage um, and her work. Um, they loved her bearskin coat um, and they loved her colorful method of painting and the fact that she would go outside to do it. Um, but there's a specific language used um, to describe her when they associate her art with a sense of masculinity. Um, and this is similar to how Edward Redfield um, is described. Um, um, so if you look at this painting, you know, he's, his painterly style is often described as like, strong, rugged, even virile. Um, again, it's kind of determined in these masculine, um, or sorry, defined in these masculine terms. Um, and, you know, this is an era when women um, were mostly able to pursue an arts education and even careers as artists, but they weren't really seen as professionals on equal footing as men. Um, Men still largely dominated the field, as Laura mentioned, um, and women faced a lot of challenges. Um, they weren't always included in exhibitions with men. Sometimes they were like directly excluded or relegated to separate spaces. Um, so a lot of women, you know, they, they formed their own organizations, um, you know, organized their own shows. Fern Coppage was a part of the Philadelphia 10, of course. Um, and so she was very active um, in promoting her own work, but also the work of other women. Um, so um, yeah, I mean, a lot of her work is just described in these these critical terms, and it's almost like if it's almost as if the critics are describing her creativity in terms of masculinity, in, or in order to validate her work, as if she was as good as you know a, a man painting these scenes. Um, so if we go back to these quotes, um, all of these uh, examples I've given is they give her this persona. Um, she's this adventurous, rugged woman artist. Um, they even like reflect how her work would have been different if she was born. In man. Um, so if we go back to this pink tea painter, if we look um, a little bit further down the paragraph, it says, there are no delicate still lives or post nudes in her exhibition. All are comprehensive settings of nature in the raw into which man must fit himself if he can survive it. So again, um, masculine pronouns, you know, she's not delicate. They, they really don't like these feminine terms. Um, and I don't know, I, I, did, I wasn't familiar with pink tea painter before, so I, I looked into this term too. Um, so pink tea is just like a 
a word for like, you know, formal tea in an interior setting. Um, but I found it a little funny in the Mirror Webster dictionary, there's like a second um, de definition of it where it says, um, it's defined as a decorous or namby-pamby affair or proceeding. And Nambi Pambi is like effeminate. So again, it's like, it's everything is gendered. Um, so, and you know, Frank Coppedge is always like blurring these gendered lines. Um, and it seems like, it seems like the critics just loved her for that. Um, and what I find even more interesting um, about these descriptions um, is that they all kind of describe Fern as like leaving her comfortable warm studio and going outside to produce her work um, despite the challenges of the weather. Um, and I think this is interesting because if we think about it more broadly um, in terms of the overall movement in this era of women moving out of the domestic space away from domestic responsibilities and pursuing educations and careers, um, this is a trend that we see in the scrapbook, um, not just with Fern, um, but with other people too. Um, so with this uh, page that I shared earlier, the New York Evening Post, um, it's written by Marianne Clyde McCarroll. And she was an early um, columnist um, in New York City. Um, so she had her own column in a daily um, publication um, and it was called Women in Business. Um, and she was the first woman to be issued a press card by the New York Stock Exchange. Um, and she also had her own byline in the New York Post and in the New York Sunday World. And she was um, a women's editor um, for one of those publications too. Um, so I guess what I'm taking away from all of this um, is that, first of all, uh, Fern Coppedge was clearly an adventurous, prolific um, artist who had quite the personality um, and a de determination to succeed um, and a desire to see other women succeed. Um, but it's also, um, these scrapbooks are really interesting, just for all the other contexts we can glean from them, just about kind of the world in which these people lived, um, the challenges people faced. Um, but you can also, you know, just like look into, you know, the writers of this article. Um, and you know, figure out the different things about that person. And there's just so much, the more you dig into the scrapbooks, there's like more you find. Um, so they're just really valuable resources. Um, yeah, and that, that's my story about Fern Coppage and her bare skin coat. Um, <laughs> um, so I'll pass it along to Adrian. All right, give me a second and I'll share my screen. All right, well, thanks, Laura. Thanks, Tara. Um, so today I'm going to share with you a little bit about, um, I'm going to share with you about, uh, I'm going to share about Fern Coppage clearly, um, but from a previous special exhibition that we had at the Michener, which uh, highlighted um, a special collection from the New Hope Silbury School District. And during that time, I was fortunate to work with the teachers and the administration um, to develop the exhibition and also with some folks from the Solbury Township Historical Society. Um, but also the scrapbook was a real integral part of the, the research process. And that's why I'm coming to you today to talk to you a little bit more about it. And I think some of the folks from the district are actually tuning in today. So please, uh, you know, let us know you're here in the chat. Thanks for joining us today. So. Like I said, um, the scrapbook was a valuable piece of um, research material for the show. And, um, you know, Coppage was notorious for not necessarily titling, titling her work or um, indicating anything on her canvases as to the dates. So, you know, looking at newspaper clippings um, allow us to provide that accurate information as in researching her work. So that's, that's really valuable. And this is a shot of the installation when it was here in 2016 in the Betts Hankin Galleries. And it was on view for about a year and a half, two years. There was also some of the works from the New Hope Sulbury School District in our Buyers Gallery. And so up until that time, the, uh, the work from the New Hope Sulbury School District was on view in the administration building. But in 2016, the school district went, underwent some renovations. So to continue to share the artworks with the students and the general public um, during the renovation project, the New Hope Sulbury School District and the Michener collaborated for the first time to display the selection of works from their collection. So it was really special to be able to share that and celebrate it um, to, the, to the public. And you might be wondering, you know, how school districts have art collections. Um, and believe it or not, uh, there is a really rich history in the Bucks County area and also in this region 
of schools um, traditionally assembling collections to use in the classroom beginning at the turn of the 20th century. So it's not surprising that an area um, like New Hope um, with its rich heritage in the arts would have relationships with the artists and incorporate the work of these artists in their hallways. And some of the artists sent their um, children to, um, to school in the district. So it's not surprising that that relationship um, was there. And of course, the district is very close to Phillips Mill, which was really the heart and home of William Lathrop and the Center for Artist Gatherings at that time. So the New Hope Silbury School System started their collection around 1914. Work came into the, the collection as um, in many different ways as donations from artists and their families, gifts from student councils, and occasionally purchases that were made in the general course of collecting in memory of teachers and administrators and openings of new schools. So anyway, so that's a little bit of background about that. Um, and what we'll do is we'll take a look, we're gonna look at the first work of art that's a pretty special one. And, and Laura alluded to in her, her um, talk a little earlier. Um, and this is a painting that is in the collection of the New Hope Silbury School District. And it was done a year after she traveled to Europe. And it's a pretty significant piece. So let's take a look. So the work here is actually featured, um, the scrapbook, if you've been to the exhibition, the scrapbook is actually volume three is open to the actual page of the painting that we're gonna talk about. And we're gonna look at this, um, it's called The Golden Arno. It was published in the Literary Digest on March 1st, 1930. And um, so hopefully you've seen the scrapbook or you can visit it online. But as, as Laura mentioned, um, Coppage did travel uh, to Europe in the summer of 1925. And she didn't often travel outside the region, but that period in the summer of 1925 was said to be really uh, led to a metamorphosis in her style and leading to the simplification and the flattening of shapes in her work in the bolder use of color. And so she was um, really, really influenced by what she saw in, in, Tus in the Tuscany region in Italy. And there's, there's some other evidence of European landscapes in Coppage's work, just a few. So it's pretty special that this work does exist. Um, there's evidence of her work in um, a composition from Prague and from Austria and also um, near Northern Italy as well. So critics at the time noted that upon her return, she displayed a much more fluid handling of paint and a sophisticated appreciation for pattern. Um, and she, she depicts this composition in a way that is more design-based. It's not a uh, representation of what she saw, but it was her interpretation. And also the canvas becomes a pattern in of itself in, in shapes and lines and so forth. So in terms of the significance of the publication, actually the Literary Digest by 1930 had a circulation of about a million readers. And it was actually the precursor to the Reader's Digest, which is pretty phenomenal to think about that, you know, and in the 1920s, this publication started publicizing famous paintings on their covers. Um, it was actually founded by, um, published by Funk and Wagnalls. Um, it eventually, um, it, started in 1890 and eventually closed and merged with some other publications by 1938 but it really gives a uh, you know some insight that you know um you know our our fern was publicized in this significant news publication uh to about a million a, a million readers so let's take a look a closer look at the painting itself and here it is um so for those of you who've traveled to florence in the tuscan region and the scene, the Arno River, no doubt it's a beautiful setting. Um, you know, please indicate any comments in the chat um, and your reactions to this painting. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read to you the quote that Ms. Hoppage said after she came back and created this painting. From my hotel overlooking the Arno in Florence, looking from the balcony window, I saw the Arno River flowing gently like molten gold. It was late afternoon and lazy Italian boatmen floated past in the dark, sturdy barges, wending their way down the river. Along the opposite bank were charming old stucco houses in colors of pale and rusty yellow, rose, pink, and old red. 
tiled roofs, arched doorways, and deeply recessed windows, balconies, towers, and turrets against the background of cypress trees, all mirrored in the waters of the Arno. Church towers and ancient castle walls pattered against the hills inspired me and thrilled me with an irresistible desire to put my canvas, put on canvas my impressions. So pretty, pretty amazing um, statement by, by Fern um, about her, her impression of Tuscany and, and, this, and this piece. So she got a significant amount of recognition for this painting. Um, it's in included in a number of clippings in the scrapbook, which I'll show you momentarily. Um, the painting was included in exhibitions in New York, in Boston, in Philadelphia, and in 1926, it was regarded in one of the exhibitions of the Philadelphia 10, where it received a lot of acclaim from viewers and critics. Um, and there's no record of it being exhibited after 1930. So um, most likely the painting was acquired by the New Hope High School by when after the school opened in 1931. So a pretty special, a special, special work. Now, Fern Coppage was also notorious for creating many different versions of the same vantage point and the same landscape. So there's actually another version um, that Fern Coppage created called Florentine Gold um, in a private collection. And I thought I would show that to you all because again, it's Fern would, you know, create the many, many different versions of the painting. And at first glance, these two paintings seem very similar, but yet I encourage you to look closely and indicate it in the chat if you can see the differences. But I'll just, I'll point out, if you look at the foreground of the paintings, you can note that there are differences in the boats here. So she's included in the Golden Arno uh, two boats, but yet in Florentine Gold, she has one here. Um, again, a very similar uh, rendering of the image, but um, if you see in the background here, there is this lovely castle-like structure with turrets and a tower, and yet she did not include that detail here in the other, other version. So pretty cool, kind of, kind of fun to take a look at different things here on Coppage's uh, work. So let me move on to the next slide here. So as I mentioned, it was recognized um, quite a bit, um, this painting in her body of work. Uh, these are two clippings from the um, some of the scrapbooks. Um, on the left is the Christian Science Monitor, uh, published in June of 1926. And then on the right is the Philadelphia Public Ledger uh, from February 1926. And both of them um, really praise Fern in her um, rendering of this painting, uh, but also indicate how much it influenced, uh, but she has not lost, you know, she's an American painter um, and that's some of the critics have said, you know, she captured a lot, it got a lot of influence from her travels in Italy, but also never lost that being an American painter and, and sharing her, her, her changes in her, in her landscapes after, after her experiences. So actually the Christian Science Monitor uh, quotes says, uh, fresh from the Pennsylvania hills, Fern Coppage stepped eagerly into the romantic beauty that wraps, wraps itself about Italy with such insistent appeal. Out of the wonder of her Italian summer, many canvases grew, but no one of them has greater charm or distinction than the Golden Arno, before which admirers of Mrs. Coppage's work linger happily. So, and it also speaks about how as a young girl at the age of 14, she was determined to become an artist and she certainly, certainly did. Um, and then on the right with the public ledger um, article, it talks about how this painting broadened her viewpoint in both a compositional way and a technical way. Um, and she came from Europe from an, as with an emotionally refreshed state, but had never lost or abandoned her American outlook on life, so. Just little tidbits here. Um, moving on to two other, um, this one, these two clippings are from Feature the Painting as well. On the left is a exhibition of the National Association of Women Painters and Sculptors um, at the Hotel Astor in 1927. And then on the right here is a Boston exhibition in 1929. Again, speaking very favorably of uh, the Golden Arno here. Um, she had about 20 paintings on view at the Miles Standish Gallery uh, back in that day. 
So let's move on to the second work of art I'd like to highlight that we looked use the scrapbook for for this installation. And here we are. So the second painting that I want to highlight for you all is entitled Evening Local New Hope. And it's also referred to in the in some clippings as the New Hope Local. Um, and the reason, again, we know this title is thanks to the scrapbooks um, and the publications that it was featured in. And in the school district records at that time, it had been noted and titled as the five o'clock train and created in 1944. So when we saw the clippings in the scrapbooks, it was really exciting to be able to hone in as to, you know, the creation date and the title accuracy with with the uh, with these with this particular painting. So if you're familiar with New Hope, I don't I'm going to put that out in the chat too. Um, if anybody can anybody recognize the setting um, of this particular painting um, or any of the buildings in the work, I would definitely would love to, uh, you know, see if anybody does. And Matt, if anything comes through, please share because I can't see the chat right now. Um, but uh, I'm curious if any of our audience members uh, recognize the setting. And what I love about paintings, and especially when I'm teaching kids or adults about paintings, is that they're like primary documents. And they allow us to make connections to history and a place. And uh, this really special painting allows us to get a, do a little deep dive into the historical background of the schoolhouses of the New Hope Silbury School District because this particular painting features New Hope Elementary that was in operation and my mouse is hovering over the building. Um, and this, this elementary school operated from 1859 to 1938 and it served grades one through 10 in its two rooms. And there were a total of 21 one room schoolhouses in the Solbury and New Hope area, uh, the first of which opened in 1756. So, at, you know, this is a this is very cool to be able to see that we've got the schoolhouse featured in here and it was located off the hill of West Mechanic Street um, in New Hope. And now this building, um, if uh, right here, is is the home of the New Hope Jewish Congregation. And forgive me, I probably am not pronouncing this correctly, but it's Kehalat Ha Nahar, um, which is known to locals as Little Shul by the River, um, and it's been in operation since the mid 1990s. So this building has actually undergone quite a quite a bit of ownership. Um, so. Uh, that's, and again, Fern did a number of versions of this landscape, of this setting, um, and I'll show it to you momentarily. Um, it was most likely acquired by the high school around the mid-1930s. And not only can we learn about the history of the school district's schoolhouses, but also we've got the wonderful um, train featured in here, um, which can tell us a little bit about the uh, railroad history um, of, of the area. And the tracks, even though, you know, Fern was, you know, she's manipulated the space and depth of this painting. Um, and she's got these tracks coming in on the right here, which is a little bit of manipulation of <laughs> perspective. Um, but the tracks actually run parallel to West Mechanic Street. So, and she does talk about, um, there's a clipping in the scrapbook, which I'll show you right here. Um, in and it talks a little bit here about at the bottom about um, this work, the evening local. Um, the Philadelphia Inquirer published this little piece, and it says Fern Coppage devotes herself almost exclusively to the landscape in the neighborhood of New Hope, which she interprets through the eyes of a wonderfully sensitive artist, at times rendering with rare charm a scene which many eyes might appear commonplace. In the evening local, she has created a striking effect by the introduction of the curved line of the railroad tracks to the right of the canvas, while to the left, she has piled up on various planes the houses of a quaint village. And so for those of you Coppage fans, um, we, we love talking about her color use. And this is just a wonderful painting to, to talk about. You can see those bold yellows um, and greens. She's got yellow ground here. She's got red hills and red trees and, and purples and all these bold colors that are, are happening in this painting. So um, pretty, pretty neat. 
Um, let me move on here real briefly. I want to be mindful of our time, but um, there are two publications that this painting was publicized in. Um, the first one that I'm going to show you is the Bucks County School Review, um, and it was reproduced uh, in May 1935. And this was a publication that was uh, a biannual cooperative periodical. It was distributed by the Bucks County Teachers Association and an executive committee of administrators in the school system. Um, and it's important to note that Fern not only has work in the New Hope Solbury School District, but she's also represented in other collections and school systems in this region. So Fern really not only was celebrated in the general press, but also celebrated locally and being a very big part of um, a, with the children and the students of, of Bucks County. So, and very often Fern would have exhibitions at her home studio um, on North Main Street in New Hope, known as Boxwood. So students and teachers and administrators most often, most likely would visit her, her, her studio for her shows. And um, so some of the work might've come into the district in that manner. So another, another work, um, I, I mean, another publication that Fern was publicized in, a local publication, which was called New Hope. And this was a short-lived publication, but a very important one for the history of the region. Um, she was uh, publicized in 1933, in November of this, of this local arts magazine, which was done, um, which was edited and published by the modernist painter, Peter Keenan. And um, he founded the magazine and the first issue was um, in August of 1933 and it only had 12 issues. It lasted till October, 1934. But this particular publication really highlighted the, the growth of the modernist artists and the independence, independence um, during the 1930s um, in New Hope. And it was a publication that began as um, a local publication that celebrated uh, writings of residents, but then grew into a really a, um, an important um, publication that really got the really gave a lot of publicity to the New Hope uh, modernists that really was burgeoning in the in during that decade. Um, the New Hope community prided itself on artistic diversity and but you know the impressionists and the modernists didn't coexist in complete harmony and this publication actually allowed for more of the modernist voices to to come through and for Fern to be publicized on this particular publication um, was pretty significant. The modernists clearly admired her work and admired her style. Um, and she was included in the last issue of in October of 1934, um, really being celebrated as one of the artists who really um, was an individual and they really admired her work. So I wanna show you the other versions of the uh, this particular painting um, and here on the left, this is actually the, the painting that's called Five O'Clock Train New Hope. You can see there's definitely some differences in the versions and on the right, um, there's this was a study for Evening Local that was done uh, for the painting. So pretty amazing to see the different, different uh, approaches Fern had in this particular viewpoint. You can still see the schoolhouses there. We have the train tracks still included on the left, but here on the right, the study, you know, really is very, very simple compared to the, to the final works uh, of this particular painting. So I think I will, I will leave it at that because I know Matt would like time for some Q&A on this program. I'll leave you with an image of the installation at the district right now. And, and you know, it's, it's fantastic that the district has such a, fantastic collection um, that the students can experience um, right there um, at the school. So thanks so much and uh, I'll uh, pass it along to Matt now and I'll stop my share. Wow, thank you, Adrian, Tara and Laura, our resident Coppage detectives. Oh, wow, that's so cool to find all that information and the the details of it is just really enlightening and really brings this uh, important artist to life. So thank you each of you for the time and energy you put into uh, uncovering these and sharing them with us today. 
we have come to the portion of our program where if you have questions for any of our panelists, uh, we'll be happy to talk, take those. Um, if you want to unmute yourself and ask them, please just jump in the chat and say so. Otherwise, you can just put your questions in the chat and I'll get to them. Uh, we did have one uh, early on uh, from Sandy who said that uh, the WHYY presentation of Antiques Roadshow included a coppage work. Uh, is there any inside info you might be able to share in the case? Did you catch the episode? Did you, Laura Terror, Adrian, did you catch that episode? I, I did not. Um, I'll, I'll, have to, I'll have to look into that. I, Coppage was a prolific painter. There are a lot of Coppage paintings out there. Um, so I'm not surprised that they're popping up in all sorts of places. Someone, we got a message from someone in our, to our main email address, the museum's email address recently that let us know that there was a Coppage on eBay. <laughs> so it's, uh, yeah, they're, they, they're kind of everywhere. <laughs> and also, there's also a lot of paintings that look like Coppage too. So that's, that's part of it, but um, I'll have to look. Is, is Sandy, I don't know if I see them. I don't know if Sandy's on, but I'm just curious how it, how it did it do on, <laughs> on, the, on Roadshow? To get a good um, value? Uh, <laughs> yeah, oh, I believe nice. it was $120,000. Wow, that's and a really nice, if, very nice one, yeah. If, I'm, if my memory's correct, it was a painting of the Hills of Conshohocken Oh. And the woman who brought the painting acquired it, I believe, from her father, who was a physician. And this was how she paid her doctor's bill. Ah, uh, yes. You hear that a lot about Pennsylvania Impressionist painters. And in fact, we have a number of works in our collection that were um, given to a local New Hope doctor um, as, as a form of payment by, by, all, by all sorts of, of painters in the area. So that's a great story. I'll have to I'll have to look into that. Thanks, Sandy, for letting us know. You're welcome. My pleasure. And right, I see I no, someone. Nora has her hand up too, and if we want to take a in-person question. Yeah, Nora, yeah. if you want to unmute yourself, go ahead. Um, hi. Uh, thank you. This is fascinating. Um, two sort of related questions. Um, one is um, to what extent, if any and maybe not at all, uh, did Coppage keep a list of her works um, that she had completed? Um, that's the first question. And the second is, did she ever um, take commissions? So in terms of the first question, not that I know of, did she have a list of, of her artworks? I think the scrapbooks are really one of the few documents of her career. We, we don't have a journal or a, or a diary or a, or a ledger book by her. The this, this scrapbooks are really, I think, the, the, the hmm. most important research that we have. In terms of commissions, I that I'm not sure. Adrian, do you know anything about commissions? No, unfortunately, I don't. I don't. I know she did. She frequently painted, as, as Adrian showed, this the same scene multiple times, which to me doesn't says it, that that was that would not have been for a commission necessarily. Um, so I don't know. I don't think we have any documentation of that of her painting on commission. But that's a great, that's a great question. Thank you. Great. We've got a couple of questions, and Liz Sheenan from the school district is here. That people want to know if they can see these paintings that are. Um, are owned by the school or on display with the school. Liz, can you can you unmute yourself to answer those? I know you did it in the chat, but I'm sure other people are curious as well. Sure. Um, yes. Uh, thanks for having me today. This is a it's such a great group, a uh, huge group of people um, to learn about Fern Coppage, which is amazing. Um, so yes, um, the the collection is in the district office building on. Um, Bridge Street in New Hope. These uh, buildings are not open to the public, but I'd be more than happy to arrange a visit with the administration at a convenient time. The whole collection is together in our conference space to facilitate students coming through and seeing all the work together. Um, so, uh, you know, there's there we have a lot of great work there, as you saw. Thank you, Adrian, again, for um, sharing and supporting our collection. So I'd be happy to talk to anybody. I put my email in the chat if you'd like to reach out. Great, thank you, Liz. Um, a couple more questions here. Uh, uh, did Fern ever paint portraits, people? I've never seen a, a portrait. 
No, Adrian's saying no too. Yeah, neither have I. In fact, I, I you know, besides perhaps silhouettes of figures like in um, the Golden Arno, I, there's really not a lot of people <laughs> in her paintings at all. <laughs> So no, I mean, I wonder, I, I imagine when she was studying at the, at, you know, in, at school in these different art academies, she must have painted the figure at some point, but there's no, I have never seen a, a Coppage portrait. Yeah. Well, you know, hands and ears are hard to paint. So sometimes you just get around <laughs> all of that, just painting trees and, and trees and mountains. Um, it could be tricky too sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question though for you all. So this, um, these books that we were all looking at, I want to know what was their original sort of purpose? Was it just for posterity? Was it like a, a website that Fern would use to show her accomplishments? What was the original intended purpose of these, these books? So that's a, that's a great question, Matt. And actually one of the scrapbooks, I'm, I, I, I forget which one exactly, but I'm, you, can, you can see this too if you search the scrapbooks. One of them says on the cover, right inside property of fern coppage please return if taken or something like that and so to me that that says that it was that they might have been left out perhaps at some of her solo exhibitions to show um to give an example of her past work and and career um but i'm not you know i'm not entirely i'm not entirely sure that's just my impression just based based on the fact that her name was in it and it was you know don't no that's what it says it says do not take away <laughs> Oh. So it must have been left out. They must have been left out somewhere where people could browse through them. So it could have been, it could have acted like, like you said, like an artist's website would today or like a CV would have, <laughs> would be today. What do you think, yeah. Adrian? Adrian of Tara, I don't want to hog all the answers. So if any, if either of you want to jump in. <laughs> Tara, do you have anything? No, I mean, that's pretty much my understanding of them too. Um, yeah, what about you, Adrian? Yeah, pretty much. Same here. <laughs> Great. Um, one uh, uh, reminder, we'll probably have time for one or two more questions. So if you have any, please put those in the chat. Uh, Meredith asked, uh, do you say the children of the cottage as well as other members of Philadelphia 10 attended school in New Hope or Salisbury School District? Um, Adrian, do you, do you have an answer for this? I, oh, maybe you put one in the yeah, actually I did. Uh, so thank you, Meredith, for your question. No, and some of the artists who lived in New Hope did send their children to the district, like Kenneth Nunemaker, for example, sent his kids there. I'm not aware of um, and, uh, other artists particularly, but I, Nunemaker does come to mind, um, first of all, for, for the children that going there. And Coppage didn't have any children. Right. Yeah. So thanks. All right, if there's... One more. Uh, There's another school district question. Yeah, do other school districts have art? Is that right? Yeah. Do other school districts collect art? Yeah, so there are districts um, around in Bucks County um, that have um, collections as well as Philadelphia, um, also in Lehigh County, um, in Montgomery County. So the, the collections really range um, and it's, it's largely due to, um, we could go down the rabbit hole of <laughs> talking about how these collections came about, but it's oh, one particular artist was a large influence in developing a lot of the collections here on the East, um, in, on the East Coast, which was Walter Baum. And he was a huge influence in, in encouraging collecting um, uh, to many different schools and in the you know Allentown area and Lehigh County, all the way down to Delaware County and to Philadelphia. So his relationships really allowed for um, the act of collecting, and also largely due to um, two significant movements in education at the turn of the 20th century called picture study and schoolroom decoration, which were these movements that really encouraged the study and usage of actual artworks in the settings of schools. And they actually, the idea of having art as part of the environment of a schoolroom was to instill good morals and good behavior and good manners and good spiritual nature with kids. So, you know, the, the, it was very much, uh, for many different reasons, collections evolved and across the country. There's collections in 
Pittsburgh area. There's collections out in California, out in Texas. But we can say that on the East Coast here, we're, we're thankful to Walter Baum for much of his influence and in influencing a lot of the different districts in Bucks County um, and so forth. So yeah. Wow. That sounds, <laughs> Sorry, I can go on no, and on that about it. like a topic for a whole nother event. I'm really, I didn't know that. And that's really interesting. Thank you for sharing that, Adrian. No problem. Well, it seems like we are at the end of our time here today. I want to remind everyone that uh, you will be getting a recording of this event sent to your email. Uh, so don't worry if you want to rewatch it or share it with your friends or family. I want to remind you, if you enjoyed today's program, we have lots of virtual programs ongoing at the museum. Uh, so please check out the website to sign up for those. I also want to remind everyone that uh, Laura will be teaching her curators class. So if you like this learning environment, I highly suggest you all uh, take a look at that program as well. Uh, last but not least, I want to remind you, if you enjoyed today's program, please tell your friends, tell your family, tell people you don't like. Uh, this is the way we get the word out and get these communities of events uh, active and vibrant. So. Lastly, I want to thank all of you for joining us. I want to thank Laura. I want to thank Tara. I want to thank Adrian for presenting with us today. And last, uh, until we see each other, everyone, I want to remind you to stay safe, stay healthy, and stay arty, everyone. We'll see you later. Bye. Thank you, everybody.